The first thing is in PCNs, you've got this, this imbalance. You'll all be familiar by now with the concept of a lead practice model. That was that's something we've been, we've been talking about, people have been talking about from the very beginning. Lead practice model, meaning a, a practice takes the lead in the PCN and employs most of the R's resources. Now, when you only had one or two resources, that wasn't such a big issue. But now you've got many more resources. If you're following a lead practice model, then of course that practice is taking a lot more risk than anybody else because obviously when you employ staff, sometimes things go wrong. It's just the nature of, of employment. And when things go wrong, the, the employees will look to their employer. And if that employer is a lead practice, then the lead practice is the one who has to deal with it. And indeed, if there are costs to follow, they have to pay those costs. Now, if you've got a well-drafted PCN schedules, then you, that lead practice can look to the other practices to, to chip in and contribute to any costs, but that's not a terribly comfortable place to be for the lead practice, because obviously they're taking more risk than the others. So as it gets bigger, it becomes less comfortable to be a lead practice. So what can you do? Well, you could use a flat practice model, which again, this term is, is fairly well understood now. What it generally means is that you're sharing the risk around. You'll, you generally will look to share the resources around the PCN in, um, by having different practices employing different resources. And that's kind of works by sharing the risk because you've at least reduced it on a single practice. The problem with that, it then introduces other problems, such as the fact that the PCN resources will inevitably have different terms and conditions depending on where they're employed. So you could have a clinical pharmacist engaged in practice A on 22 days holiday and a, a clinical pharmac pharmacist engaged in practice B on 25 days holiday. If they only work in those practices, that's not such an issue. But if they work on a shared basis, which of course is the idea with PCNs, then it is an issue because you've got resources who superficially appear to be the same when actually you're, you're engaging them on different terms and conditions. And you can't really get around that because if you try and, and, and make the, uh, the, the PCN resources have the same terms and conditions, then they'll be different from the other staff within the one practice. So you can generate these, the, the, these practical operational issues if you try and mitigate your risk using a flat practice model. Then there's the, the famous um, irrecoverable VAT problem. So VAT, I'm sure if you've had anything to do with PCNs over the last two and a half years, you're probably sick to death of hearing about the uh, VAT. The reason for that is because it's structural, because um, when you, any transaction that happens between businesses is potentially um, a vatable transaction and indeed HMRC would say it is a vatable a transaction unless you can show me why it shouldn't be and when you share resource or indeed anything else between practices you are creating a business to business transaction so if a if an R's resource is if a if a, I don't know, a nurse practitioner is, is employed in practice A and spends some time in practice B then there is a business to business transaction going on and HMRC will say well that I want my VAT, please. In year one, it wasn't such an issue because you could say, well, well we, we, we don't do it enough to cross the VAT threshold. So therefore, we'll, we'll, we'll simply ignore it because we, we, we're not big enough. Now, I'm afraid everybody's big enough. You're all turning over probably about a million, million and a half through your PCNs. That's, that goes way beyond the VAT registration threshold. So um, then you have to look at, is it actually a VATable um, transaction? And the answer to that is nobody knows. It really, it's really, really hard. Just because you are GP practices doesn't mean to say that you're completely outside the scope of VAT. It all depends on the detail of what that transaction is. Um, the one I like to talk about is um, is the Jaffa Cake case, uh, Jaffa Cake case, which um, demonstrates the complexity of VAT. Cakes are exempt for VAT. Biscuits aren't. So what's a Jaffa cake? Is it a cake or is it a biscuit? Um, and this went through huge amounts of tribunals and everything about 20, 30 years ago to determine whether or not it was a cake or a biscuit. If you're interested, I'll tell you the answer afterwards. Um, but the difference in terms of whether it's vatable or not hung on that question. Is it a biscuit or is it a cake? 
Now that was a, just, a, just a Jaffa cake. Can you imagine how difficult it is when you're looking at the kind of services that are provided within a PCN? That's why VAT is a difficult issue. It's really complicated. And if you get it wrong, it's really expensive because you've then got to add 20% to all of the um, all of the costs. So that just adds 20% automatically to the costs in the in the um, PCN because you can't recover it. So it's really, really difficult issue, which is simply baked into the structure. The next problem is a problem of success, really, that these days everybody thinks that PCNs are the solution to all of the problems in the NHS, which obviously is pushing it a bit, but it um, nonetheless, it means that PCNs are receiving lots of opportunities to, to, to get additional income. Um, and indeed, you know, even the letter that came out a couple of days ago about the uh, ICS isn't the way they're going to work. Have you noticed how everything talks about PCNs now and much less talk about practices? Well, what that means is there's more income coming in at, at uh, PCN level. That seems to be on doubt. What it will be, I don't know, but there's certainly going to be more income. And also, as you've got more resources, you're going to have to put them somewhere. Now, eventually, you run out of space in your practices. So where, where do they go? You're going to have to find some additional space. And you're going to have to start contracting for leases and stuff. Do you want to put those into your practices? So because the PCN doesn't have a contracting entity, that becomes a problem because the PCN is just a contract. Until you have an entity you can call the PCN, the only thing you've got left is the practices, and the practices then have to, in the same way as they're engaging the staff, they'd have to take leases, they'd have to take contracts, all of which starts to be a, become a little uncomfortable. Then, in the current model, you start having potentially governance issues. Now, in a practice, things are generally well governed because in the end, you know it's your money, you know the parameters of what the practices are, you know who your employees are, you know what your income is, you know what your costs are, and then it, it, it's kind of well governed. You'll, the partners will sit around the table with the practice manager saying, Let, let's talk through all of this, let's understand where we are, we know what's in the bank, all of those basic, basic governance issues. In my experience, and unsurprisingly, that is not the case with many PCNs because in the end, who owns the PCN? Whose job is it to understand what's in that bank account today? In reality, there's usually only one practice that can even see what's in the in, in the bank account today. Who's who's reconciling? Who's making sure that you claim back all the income you, you, you should get? Who's making sure that all the expenses are properly paid? All those sort of basic fundamental governance issues are often not there. Often I just see some calculations on a spreadsheet. And that's worrying when you've got over a million pounds going through a PCN because eventually something goes wrong. So those problems are then built upon unlimited liability because obviously most practices are unlimited liability partnerships. And so if you don't have an entity called the PCN, where does, where does the buck ultimately stops, stop with this stuff? Well, ultimately, it stops in the only entities that exist, which are the unlimited liability partnerships. So all of those problems above, if any of them go wrong, they end up in the unlimited liability partnerships. And, who, and what does that mean? Unlimited liability means ultimately the partners in the practices are at risk, all the way down to the shirts on their back, basically. Um, so it starts to become uncomfortable because it, there's nothing, there's no structure there. And then, last, um, then the next one really is the, the, the this this risk of an accidental partnership because um, the uh, there is only one entity, one legal entity, what that you can create which doesn't have which you don't do deliberately. Because if you want to set up a company, you'd have to go off and set up a company and go through various processes. The same with limited liability partnerships. Indeed. Any entity, uh, any any entity other than a single person, you have to do something actively to set it up. Except for a partnership, a partnership is is the only business vehicle that you can set up just by by accident, and the, that's because a partnership is is simply a legally defined term of art. A partnership is something is basically defined in law as um, one or more, no, two or more persons in business together for profit. 
when PCN started, it was all about cost sharing. It was all about just sharing costs and share ours resources. There was no profit involved. You were supposed to just be sharing costs. What's happened over the last year, particularly with COVID, is that many, many PCNs have actually have made surpluses. How have they done that? Well, that's because you're paid per jab and your costs are whatever the costs are. So when you have that kind of scenario of shared income, less shared costs, rather than just cost reimbursement, that starts to look an awful lot like profit, in which case you have to ask yourself, have PCNs accidentally become uh, partnerships at will? And I suspect the answer for many PCNs is actually, yes, they have. So that's quite an uncomfortable place to be when it's completely undocumented. Then you move on to the more operational type risks. And maybe I'll pass to Cam to just to take you through these ones. Cam. Graham, I think long-term absence of yours. Yeah, long-term absence, uh, uh, very much our sort of area. It's been fascinating to listen to uh, uh, Nils about all those issues because we're starting to see, as you say, sort of two, two and a half years into the life of PCNs, people starting to come back end of the pandemic, fingers crossed, that, that these sort of practical issues are coming out. And the one thing that, that, that we're seeing when we're having conversations is very much that actually you, you need to understand what the problem is whereas our world is very much more about trying to get to the solution and it's really interesting and looking forward to hearing a bit more about how you address those bits but what the sort of questions that we tend to then start getting into conversation with with PCNs is well we have people um, that need to deliver services be they clinical directors be they the uh, a bespoke PCN manager or the practice management team from within the network and you've got people delivering services uh, that, that actually are essential for the, that PCN to maintain um, its operation. And, and in the same way as we've got it at a practice level, we're starting to see the same challenge about, well, what happens if these people are not here? Um, I use a clinical director as, as, as a, an example. Um, and tying in with what, what, what you've been saying, Niels, about the, the how you structure things, a clinical director funding could go directly to a practice and the practice are using that to cover the cost of that person not working their their, their sessions but if that person's not available does that cover does that funding continue whose responsibility is it the practice or is it the PCN to replace that person and we've seen both we've seen um, uh, practice, uh, PCN managers uh, recruited and paid for through um, core funding and if those people go off who does that work thereafter and then you've got the question of the uh, of all of those staff um, employed under the R scheme and ours whilst there's no absolute entitlement to cover sickness the expectation um, and you referring to the NHS's own uh, guidance now on this year's contract uh, it says the expectation is that um, uh, you would still be able to uh, receive funding for the sick, uh, any sick pay within the contract of the absent person. You would potentially be able to go back and um, recruit and uh, receive funding for an additional person. But that very much depends upon where you are within your hours because it is absolutely subject to there being available funding within your um, hours sum. So if, you're at, if you are a PCM, who are pushing towards the the top end of your of your funding or you've got plans to do so how do you protect those plans if people start going off and you incur another cost it's one of the questions we have and um, we also uh are starting to th questions about data protection which is very much cab uh you something that you wanted to talk about yeah um so i mean even before pcm uh, networks were in place it's data and cyber security is always up there, sort of high in priorities when it comes to insurance. Um, with, with obviously GDPR coming in, then there's new rules and regulations, fines, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what the PCN has brought in, this extra layer of risk involved, this is where data or patient data or um, employee data is moving further away from the, the, the practice itself. So where before, I suppose it was isolated within the practice, and then you have the whole NHS infrastructure there for the cyber protection. Now this data is then moving into the PCN network and then shared between other practices, other members of that PCN network. And that could be um, 
close uh, not just sort of other other uh, GP practices, but you could have your pharmacies, you then have uh, care homes, uh, other sort of voluntary uh, care providers, if you like. So data is moving from one place out to lots of different places. Um, and it all boils down to who is ultimately the data controller and data processor, who is responsible for managing that. Uh, so that's some, uh, something that needs to be identified, um, and I'm sure mostly we would have done that. Uh, but the, the risks there, I suppose, if you can look at it from the finance point of view, PCN is responsible for all the funding. They then distribute it out to the uh, members, uh, sort, of, sort of PCN network members. What if an email is intercepted between payments and account numbers get intercepted? Where is that sort of, uh, money going? Uh, well, hackers can quite easily intercept an email, change the account numbers, and all of a sudden money's disappeared. Who is then responsible? Uh, you then have other cyber risks in terms of hacking, shutting down systems, ransom. So there's lots and lots of layers involved within that. The other side of it is then becomes uh, the actual running of the PCN network. So um, obviously we've heard the, the, the big term clinical do, uh, directors. Well, what is exactly a clinical director and what capacity uh, are they involved in? What are their sort of responsibilities? Now, if you, I'm, I'm sure you all have probably looked at the PCN handbook from the BMA, um, and they provide some sort of key considerations when it comes to sort of setting up or managing the whole network. Um, and one of the big factors is the actual decision making here. Who is responsible for making the day-to-day -day decisions of how the operation works, how the network is responding? Um, and ultimately, uh, where does the buck stop if something goes wrong? Um, you know, if, if there's an issue with, uh, I don't know, uh, for example, employees. Well, if they're moving from one surgery to another, well, what happens if there is an injury or something to them in another practice? Who, who is responsible for that kind of liabilities? You then have um, the HR uh, processes, the policies and all that in, in place that could be set by these uh, clinical directors. But ultimately, the, uh, the responsibility lies within them. And it's not the actual practice or the PCM that's going to be held liable. It is them themselves uh, who will be held responsible. So we'll come, come more into those two areas in terms of how you can mitigate it and talk more about uh, the protections that are available later on in the section. Nils, back to you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, guys. So, um, no, just, you know, just on the personal liabilities, just one final thing, sorry to interrupt the, the, the Nils, just saying about the personal liabilities, the other thing that, that really wants us to fight is, is that within the, the, the networks, the, the, the clinical directors, within the, the PCN leads, within that, Depending on what you, you've changed, your, your circumstances have changed. If you are receiving an income in a different way, if you have taken, we've had people give up partnerships to become full-time clinical directors, and sick pay arrangements have been almost an afterthought. So little things like that. So don't forget the the, the absolute personal liabilities and issues for PCN leaders. 